Thank you, Miguel. Appreciate that very much. Thank you to our youth uh, for leading our worship as well. Um, it's a real blessing to have you guys, and we'd love to have you um, as often as you can. So thank you so much. Would you pray with me this morning as I begin? Heavenly Father, on this Sabbath here in December, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us and that you would be very near to us in this time in which we live. That you would have your wisdom, your grace, and your spirit leading us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you can put it up on the screen if it's possible. I thought it would be appropriate when I pray. I prayed, and I, I, uh, I believe it's the Lord's guidance. It would be appropriate to make a couple of observations before I get into the sermon as far as preliminary things that I do think are um, applicable. Uh, they come from current event issues in our world right now. Um, here comes Omicron, here comes Omicron, right down Omicron bend. Just when you thought that Christmas time would teach us to be friends. And we'll stop there. <laughs> well, but I could go line after line with it. Um, I realize that we still have significant challenges with the pandemic. The thing that is uh, of benefit to me to think of for months, even years now, people have been trying to warn the world that this is going to be endemic. In other words, this is going to be part of our world. Um, and yet it seems like we keep getting surprised when the virus evolves and there's a new uh, threat as though we were unprepared for it. And there's, there's a natural uh, human element that I understand to that. Um, I, th I guess what I would just wish to point out and say is that we need to not take our eyes off of Jesus right now out of fear for the next stage of COVID. Um, there will be this stage. And by the way, uh, it's interesting the way they name these variants. By the way, there's been over 2,000, and I think you know this, there's been over 2,000 scientifically documented variants. It's not unusual. It's natural and normal for coronaviruses to evolve. It's actually healthy for them to evolve because they are trying to find an equilibrium with the world in, uh, that they exist in. This is actually the not natural progression. Anyways, I'm not an epidemiologist or a scientist. Um, but what I do want to um, share in, in connection uh, with this um, about keeping our eyes on Jesus is that and I just lost my train of thought. Jordy, man, it was there. It was going to be powerful and profound. And then it, it slipped out of my mind. Um, oh, this is what it is. I think the way they name them. George, I forgot. You got to be with me here, buddy. You got to let me know when I've, when I've strayed. Well, the way they name them. So, you know, we've had alpha. We've had beta. Then it went to delta. Those were the first three major ones. Uh, then they skipped around a little bit with the alphabet. And now we're on Omicron, which in, in the Greek alphabet is about two thirds of the way down. If you want to see, I don't mean to wag my, my dad used to do that, drove me nuts. I don't want to wag my finger at you. If you want to see an apocalyptic uh, explosion among evangelicals, wait until Omega comes out. When they name one of these variants Omega and say Omega is out to get us, you will, and I'm, I'm just telling you, you will see an evangelical apocalyptic explosion. Because within evangelical Christianity, Omega stands for the Antichrist. Okay? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Mark, we've studied this before, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. And in the prophetic schema of most of the um, Protestant evangelical world, Omega stands for the final deception of the last days. So I'm just telling you, just like people like to make fun of Trump and say, oh, he's the last Trump, you know. Oh, and then the, when the last Trump sounds and then the Lord would come. You've heard that before, haven't you, Kim? Okay, so wait until they come out with Omega. That's the whole point. I, I think we'll begin to see some really uh, explosive things happening within the Christian world. And I mean that both seriously and somewhat ironically. But the second thing I wanted to mention, and this one is far more delicate, far more challenging, and yet I think it is incredibly appropriate and necessary for us as the church to at least acknowledge 
a, uh, a, a, an evolving thing in our society right now. And I want to be very careful, very delicate to talk about this because I know how emotionally divisive it can be. But on December 1st, in our country, the opening arguments about the law in Mississippi um, limiting abortion went before the Supreme Court. This is the first time in about 25 years that a significant challenge to Roe v. Wade has been brought before the Supreme Court. Now, listen to me, friends. I realize there are strong opinions on both sides of this. And there is a, a, an, a, it's hard to find an arena and we're even mentioning this, it's safe to talk about. If you've watched any of the protests, doesn't it just make your heart, it makes my heart hurt to see people that hold up these signs that say, whichever way you are on this issue, whether Jesus loves abortion or Jesus hates abortion, I, I just think that uh, uh, that type of uh, stance and language uh, does not help within the discussion, just personally. But here's what I want to share with you in regards to um, the message and in the lead-up. I find it extremely, again, ironic on two different levels about what is happening in our country right now in regards to this uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, thing that's happening. On the one hand, our federal government, and, and by the way, if you see no contradiction here, I, I completely respect that. But on the one hand, our government is currently arguing that an individual should have bodily autonomy and should not suffer any form of persecution regarding how they treat their own bodies. In other words, if a woman wants to have an abortion or not have an abortion, an employer cannot fire them for that, an airline cannot deny them a flight, a business could not deny them access to their business, right? That is the argument of the federal government um, when, um, in the case of, of Roe v. Wade. At the same time, in the same federal government court system at the appellate level, the same federal government is arguing that you do not have bodily autonomy when it comes to the vaccine. And you should be persecuted, not persecuted, you should be discriminated regarding how you choose to um, address the issue of the vaccine. You should be fired if you don't get the vaccine, or you should be limited from travel if you don't get the vaccine. Now, again, hear me, hear me, hear me. I'm not trying to take sides on this issue. I'm not trying to say this one, this way is wonderful and this way is awful. I just find it ironic. I find it incredibly uh, interesting that this is the place that we are at as a country. And here's something that I will share with you too. Whatever happens in this, in either of these cases, Whatever happens in either of these Supreme Court cases and how it affects us as a church, how it affects us as an individual, we should not be surprised when a godless nation makes ungodly decisions. And I know that sounds harsh. I know that I, I love this country. I know that this country has been founded and, and been led by very godly ideals. But we strayed from those ideals a long time ago, friends. A long time ago. And it should not surprise us that in the last days, as Omega is coming, did you catch that? That there's going to be ungodly things happening, led by an ungodly movement. Now, Daniel, did I say I took sides either way on that? Did I stay on that okay? All right, because I, I, my moral compass is right here, and that's helpful, buddy. Appreciate that. We live in very, very challenging times, and I know you're getting tired of hearing it. Chuck mentioned it. I've mentioned it many times. If ever there was a time to be praying and fasting, it's now. If ever there was a time to get back to church and get back to Sabbath school and behold the Lamb, it's now. If ever there was a time to reaffirm our established relationship and faith in Jesus Christ, it's now. And by the way, if you come to church next week, I'll probably say the same thing. And when you come in a couple weeks again, because it doesn't change. If we want to understand what God's plan is for the church and what God's plan is for us in the future and through this crazy time that we are in right now, we have got to behold the Lamb. Secondly, and forgive me for one more irony, I find it interesting or ironic that the way in which the timing has come for this challenge to Roe v. Wade just happened to be on the first day of the advent of the, Christ of the Christmas calendar, December 1st. I just find it interesting that right at the time that we are celebrating the infancy of Christ, we are also debating when infancy de develops value. 
And at what point infancy becomes of protected levels? I don't know the answer to all these things. They're incredibly difficult, incredibly divisive. Um, one of the questions on the survey, and oh, I, I don't have them anymore, So, but you know, you've seen him, talks about additional opportunities for study in the church. We don't have a, a Wednesday night prayer meeting currently. Um, we don't do a regular Friday night worship here in the church. One of the opportunities in the survey talks about an after-church um, afternoon in-depth Bible study. I would uh, encourage you to think strongly about those as you're filling out the surveys. Because I do think there needs to be a safe environment for Christians to discuss these things. And it's not always going to be in the sermon. It won't always work in Sabbath school. There should be opportunities for us to sit down as brothers and sisters and say, how are you navigating this issue in your family? How are, how are you finding God giving you wisdom? And I'm telling you, that's not always easy to do. I'll tell you, um, in the Adventist church, uh, one of the topics that just is, is incredibly difficult is women's ordination. There are very few arenas where it is safe to talk about that because people feel so strongly one way or the other. And I'm saying this as a pastor, guys. I've sat in pastor circles where I saw men of God nearly come to blows because they could not even talk about the issue. That's rough. And I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect. I get emotional at times. I get really into these things. But we do need to have these arenas that we can try to keep safe because I think young people especially, they want to ask about some of these tough issues. We just had a... um uh, 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 a time with both the elementary school and the academy um, talking about uh, emotions and, and, and mental health. And I was uh, very interested to hear that a lot of our young people during the Q&A time were asking some pretty in-depth questions about emotional health, how to deal with the issues that are facing us today. And I tell you what, for young people today, I, you know, most of us grew up in a day and age where there were two genders, there's not two genders anymore. I mean, that's what we're being told. Uh, we're being told to deny the, the, the rudimentary uh, things that are in front of our face. And, and how are people navigating that? How are young people navigating that? How, are, how am I navigating that? These are tough questions, aren't they? All the more reason we need to find opportunity to behold the Lamb and have guidance of Jesus Christ in our personal prayer lives, our devotions, our fasting, in our corporate worship, in our Sabbath school and study times, and as we gather in worship. All right, I'm ready to preach now. Question number one. What kinds of animals were used for sacrifices in the Bible? Was it camels, crows, and crickets? Was it peacocks, piggies, and ponies? Cows, sheep, and goats, or deer, ducks, and donkeys. Declan, I saw Ryden just about jump out of his seat. I, I feel like I need to ask Ryden. Ryden, he says it's cows, sheep, and goats. Were you going to say that, Declan, or did you think it was something else? Yeah? Yeah, all right, you guys got it. That's right. And there were other animals, too, uh, but those are the main ones that uh, God instructed were appropriate for um, sacrifice. They did uh, also do doves and birds and uh, a few other uh, animals. But th these are the main ones, okay? Question number two. What animals are often depicted at the manger with Jesus? I'm not going to give this one on the screen. I just want to hear some answers. What animals do you see in the nativity often? I saw a hand go up and then it went down. Eric and Sean? All right, yeah, right over here. Sheep and donkeys, yes, that's very common. Sheep and donkeys. Emma, yeah. Oxen, yes. Yes, oxen. You said that like, like, uh, kind of like you were questioning while you were also saying. Okay. Oxen, yes. Cattle. Any other animals? We're missing a couple that are part of the nativity story. All right. Riding? Rooster? Really? You have a nativity with a rooster? Did your dad tell you rooster? Maybe. I don't know. I, that's not a common one. Let's have a, one more answer. Animals at the nativity. Animals at the uh, manger with Jesus. Anyone else? There's a big one that's missing. Um, Eric. Horses? There were horses there too? 
Wow, maybe. All right, last one, Emma. Camels are the one that is often depicted. Now, this is tradition, of course. This is part of the story. But often camels, because of the presence of the Magi, all right, these travelers from the east who came, a lot of baby animals are often there, lambs and baby goats, even baby oxen, calves, pasture animals because of the shepherds in the manger, and then the donkey. The Bible doesn't say anything about her riding a donkey, but you always see Mary uh, riding a donkey, uh, pregnant Mary, and so the donkey's often there. Uh, but maybe it was a horse, Eric. It could have very well have been. I don't know. Roosters riding? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Don't know much about that. All right, number three, talking about animals. Why is Jesus the Lamb of God? Is he a lamb because lambs are weak and vulnerable? Because lambs are pure and innocent? Because lambs are soft and gentle? Or because lambs are young and hopeful? Why was Jesus the Lamb of God? Which one of those answers makes the most sense to you? Anybody of our young people? Katie, Addy, you want to help out? Vitor? I see you over there. Oh, Blakely, yes. She says it's because lambs are pure and innocent. How many of you have ever been among lambs and sheep? You know, I think it would be a healthy thing for all Christians to visit a farm at some time because so many of our symbols, so many of our analogies go to these animals. Uh, um, I don't know too many lambs that were pure and innocent. But anyways, <laughs> that's a good answer. Anyone else? This is kind of a trick one. I, I shouldn't do this. It's a trick one, isn't it? Because you want to know the answer is all of them. All of them. Even the weak and vulnerable. You say, well, no, Jesus isn't weak and vulnerable. He became a baby, friends. What is a baby? What is a lamb? It's weak and vulnerable. He made himself that uh, for the purpose of salvation. He was pure and innocent, soft and gentle. Jesus says uh, among his many qualities that he is gentle. Uh, he was young. He was hopeful. And all those qualities are found in a lamb. All right, one more. Who was it that said, Behold the Lamb of God when they saw Jesus. Who said that? Was that Nicodemus? John the Baptist? Was it Mary? Or was it the thief on the cross? All right, Sean, I saw your hand. He says it's John the Baptist, but Addie, what did you want to say? You, you were going to say the same thing, weren't you? You guys are on the same page, and you guys are both right. It was the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist, who saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. All right, thank you guys for helping out and being part of the kids quiz. I want to go right to that uh, verse now where John says that. It's in John 1, 28 and through verse 30. And it says this, These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. <clears throat> the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on, who, on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For he existed before me. Who was older, John the Baptist or Jesus? <laughs> John is older. He's he, The story of Elizabeth and Zechariah takes place before the birth of Jesus. He's older, and yet John recognizes that in Christ there was the immortality of God. There was the deity himself, for he existed before me. Now, there's lots of things in this that we could spend time on. I, I began working even on that word behold. And again, if you don't have a regular Bible study routine, little things like this can be a lot of fun. Study the word behold sometime. What does it mean? Why is it so common in the Bible? Is it just a kind of placeholder, like a therefore or thus? Now I'm going to tell you. What is the significance of John saying, Behold, behold the Lamb of God. Um, but that'll be for your own benefit. I think it's a worthy study of acknowledging that very important phrase, behold. He says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For he existed before me. So I want to talk about Jesus as the Lamb and what this uh, uh, idea of him being the Lamb can mean for us. Now, I, I think it's very interesting that many, if not most, of the Christian symbols that we have in the church all depict 
uh, the elements of our faith and the elements of the gospel in a rather paradoxical manner. Um, even the lamb itself is not necessarily a picture of strength and power, right? How many football teams are there that have named themselves the lambs, right? We're the lambs. We're out to get you. We're the lambs. Okay. That's not usually an idea and an imagery that, that, that would, that would predict strength and victory and power. Um, even, how about a dove? Right? It, it, you know, uh, a dove is that symbol of the Holy Spirit, you know, and that, uh, again, when you think of, you know, powerful birds, you think of, uh, eagles, you think of, uh, uh, cart, no, not cardinals, uh, you think of seahawks! Yeah, you think of seahawks! Yeah. Calm down now, I know that the Spirit's really moving over here, but we gotta, we gotta listen as we do this, alright? But in Christianity, we have a dove, we have a lamb. And then when you think of even the cross itself, what is the cross? Is the cross an image of power? Is the cross an image of victory? Well, in a way, but it's victory through sacrifice. And this is why the early Roman pagan world was so confused by Christianity. They said, you're using our, 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 our execution stake as the symbol of your victory and power. We are totally confused by this. That's the paradoxical nature of so much of what God, he comes to us in ways we don't expect. The disciples said, hey, are you here to help us overthrow the enemy, our enemies? No, no, you need to pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What? What are you talking about? Jesus is the Lamb, and understanding all of that, there's so much that we can learn, but we're just going to uh, touch on it a little bit uh, today. Jesus was the Lamb. Long before John saw Jesus coming to him to be baptized, long before there was any other acknowledgement of the personality of Jesus, Jesus was the Lamb. Before Bethlehem, Jesus was the Lamb. Before Abraham... Jesus was the Lamb. Before Noah, Jesus was the Lamb. Before Adam, Jesus was the Lamb. There's several places that we can look in the Bible that, that emphasize this. This here in 1 Peter is one of those. You are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from the futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but you are redeemed with precious blood, the blood of the Lamb. You say, well, that's the cross, right? That's the sacrifice. Yes, but listen, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ... For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Revelation talks about Jesus as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. When God created animals on the sixth day of creation, when he created sheep, did he not understand that he was the lamb Yes, he did. Long before he created on our world, the plan had been made. Um, I, I didn't put this in the slides. I just grabbed it from Patriarchs and Prophets. Long continued was the myster, m mysterious communion, the council of peace for the fallen sons of men. The plan have, of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth. Before God began creating, the Trinity had met and a decision had been made, and Jesus volunteered and said, should sin ever come into this creation that we're about to make, I will pay the price. He made that decision before he ever came and was part of the creative process. He was willing to be the lamb, and he was the lamb right from the very beginning, before the foundation of the earth. For Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth, Revelation 13.8. Yet it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then listen to this. I love this. this is only Ellen White could write this. Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of that love which passes knowledge? Through endless ages and mortal minds, seeking to comprehend the mystery of that incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. I, I, I just think that's beautiful. Through endless ages. You know, this means even when we go to heaven, right? Immortal minds seeking to comprehend the mystery of that 
incomprehensible love will wonder and adore. In other words, even when we go to heaven, we're not going to shrug at the fact that Jesus was the sacrifice. Oh, there's Jesus. Remember him? Oh, yeah, remember when he did that sacrifice thing? That was nice. It will continue to be the profound element that escalates and exalts Jesus above anything and everything in all of the universe. Because Jesus was the lamb right from the beginning. He was not caught off guard. I've been saying for a long time, he wasn't caught off guard by COVID. He's not caught off guard by Delta. He's not caught off guard by Omicron. He's not caught off guard by sin. He knew what the plan was going all the way back to the beginning and he was ready for it. As hard as it was for his heart and his spirit. Jesus was the lamb. Jesus became the lamb as well. Not only was he the lamb in theory, not only was he the lamb in plan, not only was he the lamb in prophecy, not only was he the lamb as a promise, he became the lamb when he was incarnated as a human being on planet earth. It was part of the process of his great uh, uh, sacrifice and capitulation on our, our behalf. Paul says in Romans, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of flesh as an offering for sin. When Jesus was born, he was born as God's offering for sin. He was born as the lamb. He didn't become the lamb when he was baptized at the age of 30 by John the Baptist. He was the lamb in Bethlehem. He was the lamb. He was always the sacrifice, always the willing, innocent party that was willing to give up his his purity and his innocence in the hopes of saving Dave Lounsbury and everyone. Philippians, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Again, Paul in 2 Corinthians, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through poverty um, you might become rich. Have you ever, have you ever stopped to think about what it was like? Put yourself in the shoes of an angel for a second. A good angel. All right. One of the good ones. All right. Put yourself in the shoes of an angel. All right. It is the time of Jesus' incarnation. Jesus is God, right? He is on the throne. He is glorious. He is powerful. And through a mystery and a miracle that we can only comprehend, the next thing you know, that's, that's God. What do you think the angels, why do you think the angels met the shepherds on that hill and broke out into glorious song? Do you think that that was just a, a planned school choir event? that they all had to show up in and wear their their dress blacks and all that? Or do you think that that was just the natural thing for those unfallen beings in wonderment and awe to cry out in joy, Hosanna in the highest, peace on earth to men? Look, do you understand what has just happened here when Jesus became the Lamb in Bethlehem? He was the Lamb, He became the Lamb, and Jesus also remained the Lamb. He wasn't just a lamb as an innocent baby. He didn't just grow up in infancy and, and through his naivety uh, until he reached maturity and then there's some, some kind of transition. He maintained his purity and innocence and his holy nature throughout his entire life. And we know that that's what made his sacrifice acceptable and holy. Isaiah, looking down through prophecy, said that he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before it shears. So he did not open his mouth. And look what he says a couple verses later. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with the rich in his death because he had done how much violence? Nor was there any what in his mouth? No violence. No violence against man. No violence against God. No deception. This is the exact opposite of Satan, by the way. This is the exact opposite. Satan says violence will get you what you want, and deception is wonderful. God was in Jesus reconciling the world uh, to himself. In him there was no violence. He remained the lamb. He remained in purity and innocence and power, the ideal for mankind and a perfect sacrifice and substitute for our broken natures and sinful situation. 
Lastly, Jesus is the Lamb forever. Forever. Now, I know that He is the Lion and He's the King. He's Lord of Lords. He's the Redeemer. He's the Ransom. A lot of, lot of beautiful things about Jesus. But when Jesus became that baby, He forever surrendered He forever surrendered elements of his deity in order to satisfy the requirements of sin and salvation. And I saw between the throne the four living creatures, the elders, and John in in vision, seeing the resurrected Christ in heaven. He says, I saw a lamb standing as if slain. Now, I know that that's in vision. And and, and in Revelation 5, it goes on... uh, I don't remember if it was before this or after it. Oh, no, this is before. Just before this, excuse me, um, John is weeping because he can't find anyone worthy enough to open the scrolls. And then a voice cries out, uh, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is worthy to open the scrolls, right? That's what John is told. And then John turns around to see the lion, and what does he see? He sees the lamb because the lion had become the lamb. It is through the sacrifice of the lion becoming the lamb that salvation has been offered to every single person here. It is the opposite of Satan. It is the opposite of sin. It is the opposite of what comes natural to our broken, sinful, selfish minds that we win through our own strength. We win through our own uh, 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 forcing our way. And then, of course, I love the story of Thomas. Then he said to Thomas, "Read." this is after the resurrection. Jesus has been resurrected. He's alive. But there's something about Jesus that is unique that will not be part of you and I uh, when we go to heaven. He tells him, I'm going to prove to you that I am the resurrected Christ. Look at my hands. Feel my My side. The scars that brought you redemption, I will retain on my body for eternity. For eternity. When we get to heaven, everything that we understand and everything we can see from Scripture and our ability to you know, see what uh, the Bible is teaching us, when we go to Jesus and He puts His arms around us, He'll still have those scars. When we put our arms around Him, we'll feel a hole where a spear had pierced His heart. I mean, I, doesn't it seem like that's what the, the Bible reveals? Did something fundamentally change in Christ when He ascended to heaven? It would seem very interesting if that was the case and how He portrays Himself to Thomas. And look what Thomas says. Thomas recognizing this Christ, he answers, he gives the answer. My Lord and my God. It was those scars, it was that evidence of His sacrifice that brought Thomas to the point of faith, of conviction, of belief. That's what Jesus wanted. That's what Jesus wants for us all to believe that His sacrifice is sufficient for our salvation. So Jesus was the Lamb from eternity in the past, from whenever He understood the risks involved with sin and with creation on planet Earth. Jesus became the Lamb when He was born in Bethlehem. Jesus remained the Lamb throughout His life, making Himself the perfect offering for sin and the answer to the brokenness of humanity, and Jesus is and will always be the Lamb. It wasn't a temporary thing. A lot of people think, oh, I can go through a small sacrifice. If on the other end I come out, it was something that Jesus took on him forever. When you talk about the depths of God's love, the extent is just absolutely amazing. Friends, there is nothing we can do better today and now then behold the Lamb. John, in a few verses later, he says he saw Jesus walking towards him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And in this case, two of his disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus.
they followed Jesus. Will you too make it your plan and intention to follow Jesus? We need Him. We need Him through all of these crazy times, through new COVID variants, through new laws, new societal challenges, all the things that we're facing. Behold the Lamb this Christmas season. Let's pray. God, thank You so much that we could spend this time thinking these thoughts and being reminded of Your power and Your sacrifice. God, give us wisdom. Help to bind us together as a church, Lord. Give us the strength that a family needs to weather uh, these times in which we live. Lord, help us to love each other as You have loved us. Help us to understand that we win through following You and following Your example for us, not through violence, not through deceit or deception, but through submitting to Your Spirit and letting You guide us every step of the way. Thank You, dear Jesus, for putting up with us. Thank You for saving us. And thank You for coming to this earth as a baby and living the life of a Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to turn in those surveys that you were filling out while I preached. And then um, we'll see you next week. God bless. (laughs)